Greetings, beloved. Let me take this opportunity and welcome and greet all of us that are on tonight in another of our Bible study series. We have been on the subject of relationships over the past couple of weeks and we have had an interesting uh, series so far. We have gone into some areas that for some it might have been new, but it is important that we understand that we must travel this road because there are many that have gone into relationships that are hurting now because there are some things that they just did not know and things that they should have known. All of us, uh, we were made with a capacity to be in relationship and to want relationship and to want to enjoy relationship. And yet, we find that many of us having gone into relationships, it's, it would appear that it is probably the worst thing that ever happened to you. And it ought not to be because uh, relationships in a broad sense is something that all of us ought to enjoy. The Bible spoke about relationship and it looked at the relationship between David and Jonathan. Uh, it looked at the marriage relationship. It looked at just friends. You know, the, the, uh, friend. there is a friend that stick it closer than a brother and it speaks in broad sense about relationships across the board. But we have been focusing our attention on the married relationship simply because uh, it, in my estimation, is going to be one of the most important relationships that we enter into. Uh, we will be bound by this relationship for life except one or either of the party uh, choose to break it by engaging and committing themselves in uh, the act of adultery that could possibly cause the thing to be broken down. But outside of that, we are into something that we are to continue in as long as this life Last and this life meaning the life that you and I live until death we are going to be separated in relation to marriage. So it is important, brothers and sisters, that we be clear in our minds that we understand what and how the Bible puts together and describe this institution called marriage we have been uh, since last uh, since we met last we've, we've looked at a couple of questions we decided that we were gonna uh, pursue some questions coming out of the sessions that we have had and it is important that we take the time yes to write the questions be free in your mind be free to express yourselves because we want to make sure that when we are through with this series, we not only just present the, the, the matters and the issues to you, but we present it with scriptures, and we want to get the feedback of the saints because there are real issues occurring in life and in our relationships. But hear this, it is important that we understand clearly that as real as the situations are, as real as the issues that confront us are, we cannot be more real than the Word of God. The Word of God is equally real. And we must never try to use reality and what happens practically in life because the Word of God is also practical. And so we can put the word aside to deal with matters in our relationships so that we might be justified 
or feel justified in taking an action here or there because the action the, the, the attitude of our spouse demanded a certain action even if that action is against the bible the bible must always be our reference and it has the final say in a lot of the issues if not all of the issues that we are going to be confronted with in our walk with our spouses and so as we take the time and as we go through we must be clear in our mind that the word of almighty god trumps everything else it trumps what our friends tell us it trumps what the so-called professionals tell us it trumps what the world system dictates it trumps what our culture embrace the word of god stands above everything else and i believe that many of us are going through some things and somehow we are unable to get answers and we are unable to forge a way out or come to some solution because we have been looking in the wrong place for answers for the issues of life and the answer can only come from the word of Almighty God. In the word is an answer for every situation that we are ever going to be confronted with this side of life. In the word. And it is important that we take the time out and go through the word. And when the word reaches us, it is important that we accept the word that we embrace the word that we love the word it is how we treat with the words of the living god that will determine the extent to which we emerge from a lot of the issues that we will be confronted with beloved so i i challenge us and i urge us i i admonish us to take time out to give heed to give ear to, to 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 look again into the world put aside let us look at what we have been experiencing since the time that we have been married let us look at some of the issues that continually present themselves to us husbands look at the situations with your wives wives look at the situation the matter with your husbands look at how it has been dealt with over the last couple of years and look at the results that has come are you satisfied with what is happening now given what has transpired over the years do you feel good do you feel confident that you have handled it properly over the last couple of years over whatever period of time it is that these issues have arisen if not then i want to encourage all of us to take time out pull back yes draw back assess what we have been doing and if it has not worked try something different try something new and what i have been presenting under god to us might be new to many or we might have heard it but somehow have not given ourselves to pursuing solutions using these scriptural principles and if we don't then i do believe many of us are attempting to fix to remedy situations that we are confronted with using man-made program i sit here this evening and i submit humbly to us that man-made solutions will never work if god already has established a program for relationships we must abide 
by the word. We must live in the word. And this is the challenging part, you know. If we are really, really Christians, we will find that it is not difficult to adhere to and to align ourselves with the word of God. But if we are not, or if we are becoming wayward, or if we are drifting, it is always going to be the most difficult thing, yes, to want to conform to what is written in the word. And I, I really want to encourage all of us to let the word speak for itself. God knows what he's doing. He is the one that established this thing called marriage. He is the one who in the beginning put the man and the woman together and declared that the two has become one. He did it. And all the issues that you and I will ever confront in our relationship with our spouses, God knew about it. And we will see that even though he knows, he didn't fix them and then put us together. He put us together knowing very well our weaknesses, our shortcomings, our short fuses, uh, our lack in certain areas. He knew about it. And he still allowed us to come together in marriage. Why? He has a reason for that also. And we will look at it. So before I jump back into the questions, I really want to use the next couple of minutes to kind of put into perspective in some reform and add a little what we have been discussing over the last couple of weeks. And I'm not doing a review of everything. No, no, no. I am just now putting into different words, but in a summary form, what this whole thing called marriage, the marriage relationship, is all about many of us or many folks are misguided many are misinformed many therefore because of the misinformation and the fact that they have been misguided have rushed into marriage and believing that it was all a romantic ride and i loved this guy and i fell in love with this girl and so the normal, natural thing to do is to just get married to the person and we will just live happily ever after until the time that Jesus comes. It does not happen like that. And although it is a fact that we all experience love and we all experience what God has placed in us, the attraction that a man has for a woman and a woman has for a man and that attraction can be powerful and it is real and it is there, it is important that we equally understand because while the attraction we feel, it is emotional and in instances it is physical, there is a part of it that is neither physical nor emotional but it is just to know and to understand this is the part that goes over the head of many so that they go into this thing, rush into this thing in many instances and are totally unaware and are unprepared for what is involved in this institution called marriage. And so the expectations are shattered. The expectations are squashed because we thought or many thought that when they go in oh it is going to be this way and I will always have this going for me and my husband will always have that going for him and we will always see eye to eye and we will conform to each other and we will make decisions in the best interest of our togetherness and as a result we will flow together in unison and in unity and always it will be that we look out one for the other if that were so um, we would not see what we are seeing in 
a lot of instances across the world. We would not see what we are seeing in a lot of instances within the circles of the church. If that were simply so, we would not have the heartaches that we read about and that we watch on television and that we listen to on radio and that we read in the papers. We would not. So clearly there are some things that somehow fly over our head and we have not looked at the nuts and bolts and seen the nitty gritty of the things that are involved. Hence the reason we are going through the way that we have been going through. So let us know that there are some responsibilities of men and that there are some responsibilities of women. And if we fail in our respective areas, we are going to be the source of damage to a relationship and to an institution that God himself ordained and established. And we need to be very careful how we treat with the things that God has placed in our keep and in our care. We need to be careful how we treat with the church that God has brought us and placed us in. Equally, we need to be careful how we treat with the institution called marriage that God established and now have brought us in. We have to be very careful. Notice from Genesis right across to Revelation, the Bible speaks about relationships and the Bible talks about marriage and the Bible looks at it from a physical point of view and from a spiritual point of view. And in Genesis there was marriage and in Revelation there is the marriage supper of the Lamb and the bride has made herself ready. And just think about it. The Genesis and the end of things and marriage is there. This thing is significantly more important important than many of us dare to want to think and believe it is and we push it aside to our detriment we push these studies aside to our hurt hurt here and possibly hurt to come i charge us and i challenge us let us take the time out and look over these notes and go through these things so that we can be clear and therefore we can take the necessary steps and do the necessary things so that we are in line with the expectations of Almighty God and that we can meet the needs of our respective spouses. It is very important. I, in, in reviewing and putting things in terms of explanation in another way, Still talking about everything that we have gone through. It is important to know that marriage is very, very, very important in the scheme of things of the Almighty. And don't ever dare to underestimate that point. In the scheme of things, in the program of Almighty God, in what it is that God wills and therefore wishes to accomplish on this earth and then move into eternal things, marriage. Yes, that institution that you and I are in right now it plays a very significant role and we miss that point to our detriment we are going we are players on the stage of life that god has set up and we are going through in this particular thing because god has allowed us to go through to play our role to play our part even while he plays his part he has a role in marriage. We have a role in marriage. He has vested interest in you as a couple. He has vested interest in me with me and my wife. This institution of marriage, God was our witness. This institution of marriage, he was the one that culminated the entire affair when he put it that 
God has joined them and has made the two become one. The pastor that married you could not do that part. The minister that signed your marriage certificate could not do that part. There is a part reserved for him. There is a part that your weaknesses have to carry out in terms of signing that they were there. So there is a part that everybody played here on earth. But there is a, another part that heaven itself plays. And this is when God was witness to your relationship, your coming together, your saying, yes, I will take this woman as my wife. Yes, I will take this man as my husband. And God saw that you came together and agreed that you were going to do this thing and he too was a witness although you might not have seen him he was there and then when this thing was not just um the husband and the wife saying i do and i will but then he was also there when it was consummated and the covenant was sealed in blood at that consolation, he was there. And so the covenant and the word that you spoke at your wedding, at your wedding ceremony, together, God witnessed it and he did his part and you did your part. And now hear how Jesus describes it. But this is very important. Hear how Jesus described it. In the book of St. Matthew, chapter number 19 saint matthew chapter number 19 i read two verses because they they questioned jesus about a particular thing and jesus was now going to speak to the issue and i want us brothers and sisters to take time out just to to hear what jesus said in his own words and when he started there in Matthew 19, he went into the scripture and then he, Jesus, quoted from the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 24. So that Jesus is talking about marriage and giving an overview of what the intent of Almighty God was as it relates to marriage. And Jesus used a quotation from the book of Genesis. He went right back to the beginning. So, since St. Matthew chapter 19, and we start at verse 5, right? I want us to just read together as we put it up on the screen and we read. I want us to look at what Jesus said and I want us to look at the quotation. And said, for this cause shall a man so jesus has gone back to the beginning he's talking about marriage and he's talking about how serious this thing is and he's jumped right back to the beginning and here he's saying for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave or cling to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh wherefore they are no more twain they are no more two but one flesh and here jesus now conveying the, the the mind of god conveying the intent of god what therefore god has joined together let no man put asunder Jesus' foundation scripture in addressing marriage was his quote of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. He went right back to the very beginning and so gave the intention of God as it relates to marriage that a man must leave his mother, a man must leave his father, 
and then he's going to take up a new nucleus a new family and when he does this and when he comes together and consummate that thing and he's joined together as man and wife he then made this very significant statement what therefore god has joined together let no man put asunder when a person speak their vow then consummate it in sexual human uh, sexual union brothers and sisters god who is also their witnessing he literally does the work in joining them together and this thing that we have where we speak that you know five years later i found out that my husband was not compatible with me and 10 years later i found out that my wife was not compatible with me we have to be very 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 careful you might not have known some things yes as man and woman you might not have known some things but can i tell us this this thing about finding somebody somebody that is compatible with you it's 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 not easy and it is not going to be possible i know the professionals say after you do everything and you work out this thing and you're quoting for how much years and you're finding out if, if the day before you're married you find that the person is not compatible then call it off because the attack you're going to have to look again for the next how much years to find somebody compatible hello brothers and sisters it is rare that there is going to be a situation where so your your somebody's cut to fit that you just fit together and so you smoothly seamlessly go through your marriage union as a couple without issues without rubbing without anything at all that really does not happen so this thing about finding the person that is compatible you will never find such a person sure there are some things that we can and will have to look for and there are some things that are clear that are no no's so we, this is not the time to go into that so we're not talking about that but we are talking about seeking and searching and praying to the point where we scout and we watch and we dig and we do everything to find the person of perfect compatibility that is not going to happen and god almighty knows that our spouses have weaknesses yes your husband have weaknesses and it's going to take a long time to work around those weaknesses your wife has weaknesses and shortcomings and it is going to take a long time to work around those issues and maybe we are going to need help maybe you are going to need assistance maybe somebody is going to have to sit with you as an individual in the relationship or as couple a couple and go through so that things can be streamlined it might be <coughs> sorry that you have to do it yourself but i submit to us that there will be in this union where god says leave your mother and your father man and join yourself to your wife he knew everything about you and he knows everything about you sir he knew everything about you and he knows everything about you ma'am and he was still a witness at your wedding and he was still still the one <clears throat> sorry that joined you that joined us together and then declared whom god has joined together let no man put asunder so he's saying that yes with your shortcomings yes with your differences yes even with your status of incompatibility at this point you are now married and whom god has joined together let no man put us on that it means that with the differences 
we are going to be together forever still and forever mean here on earth and it therefore means with our differences we're going to have to work them out with our differences we're going to have to sort them out with our differences we are going to have to make it happen with our differences we are going to have to bite some things we are going to have to bend some things but god is saying that it must happen with the understanding that I am the one that joins you together. And if me put you together, nobody, no circumstance, no issue can arise that is strong enough to set you apart. And this we must understand. So this scripture, Jesus went back to the, to the beginning to allow us to understand that if we are going to have a fulsome understanding of what we are in as it relates to relationship, we must go from the beginning. Forget about Moses writing bills of divorcement and all of those things. Forget about the fact that he had to explain that because of the hardness of their hearts and so forth. Jesus knew when he was confronted with questions from those around about those things, he put them on pause. And he automatically went to the beginning. He told them that this was not how it was intended to be. And he took them to the beginning. And then he made his point. And his point was abundantly clear. You are in this thing for life. One thing I know about God. If he brings you into it. And seal and sign it. After we have done what we were supposed to do, because remember now, we have gone through from the beginning of the series and we were looking at some things and some principles how to position ourselves to get into this thing. We must first have relationship with God, you know. God will never provide somebody for you if you first don't have something with him. Men, ladies, brothers, sisters, we must have relationship with God first before God establish a relationship for you with somebody else. And if we, if we break and miss this principle, we will going to be in some challenging times. And I therefore ask us to go back through the notes. I did say we can go over everything or through the series so that we can pick up and follow going down the line. But very importantly, as I just said, have your relationship with God so that God will help you to establish a relationship with somebody else. He will set up a relationship for you. And that is very important. Now, Somebody that is incompatible. Can it work? Yes. Somebody that have a million faults and you only have ten. Can it work? Yes. Somebody in the relationship that is not pulling their weight as they ought. Can it work? Yes. And hence the reason why it is important for us to be clear on the roles and the responsibilities of each person in the relationship. The man has a responsibility and the woman has a responsibility. And they work symbiotically. They work together. They work in support of each other. And that is very important. I always say, and I've said it since we started this, this series, I say it again this evening, just for emphasis, that if a relationship is in trouble, if a relationship needs an injection from on high, help from heaven, help from anywhere, if it needs to be inoculated so that it can be revived again, brothers and sisters, 
It takes both parties to recognize the supremacy of scriptures. It takes both parties to recognize the sovereignty of God. But it takes one to move, to initiate the move. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how long the thing has been in disrepair. It doesn't matter how difficult the discussions and the dialogue in the past. It doesn't matter what the, the, the situation was that took it to the point where it is at now. Brothers and sisters, we are first Christians. We are first children of God and because of that fact we can move to readjust to to make changes and to act rationally and to act spiritually and to act reasonably in conformity to the word of almighty God very, very, very important. I want us to know that. We must work together. You have to work together. It is rare, very rare, but it can happen and it does happen, but it is rare that a relationship, that a marriage falls into disrepair because one person was at fault. It is rare. And I've been around a little while and I've spoken to individuals in relation to these matters for a little while. And I do know that it is rare that one party out of the union would be solely responsible for the breakdown, for the crashing, for the wrecking of a relationship. It really doesn't happen like that. And so it requires both to do some things, both to draw back, both to dig deep in the word, deep in the recesses of your spirit, and come out and say, look here, this one has, but if the word of God said, whom God have joined together, let no man put asunder, I am going to follow the word. It must not be the wife alone that says that. It must not be the husband alone that says that. If, if it is a Christian couple, then both of you, have a responsibility to see the Bible for what it is and to recognize the supremacy of the Word of God and both take action. Both must recognize that I have not followed through on the Word of God. I have trampled the Word of God because there are folks that have determined that may not care what is written in the Word. This is where I am going. And I say to those persons, God bless you, but be very careful because you are trotting along a dangerous path. Yes, you are. You are trotting along a dangerous path because you choose to come into what God established and now decide that you are not going to abide by his rule. Be very careful. Of the path that you trod. I, I, I submit, husband, wife, please don't put the blame on the other. Even if 90% of it was his and 10% was yours, wife, or if 90% of it was the wife's and 10% of it was yours, husband. It don't matter if you contributed 
to the thing being in a state of disrepair, you owe it to yourselves to sit down again. Because I happen to know that some folks sit down and not once or twice or three times. I happen to know that there are some men that are what's the term to use biblically but i happen to know that there are some men that because they are men they believe that their wife is supposed to stoop and take anything that they get and accept what you give and that is a wrong concept and i reject that and any man that believes that because you are the man your wife must take what you dish out to her. You have a wrong concept. And I publicly say to you, you are utterly wrong. And if you have an attitude and a mentality like that, you are a major cause of disturbance in your relationship. No wife is going to want to put up with a man that trample on them and tell them anything and and, and, and treat them any way and then turn around and say, I am the man, listen to me. You are putting yourself up for ridicule and that is not what the word of God meant when it says the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Christ has not, has never, and will never deal with his bride in that kind of way. Take what you get and dish you dirt and how dare you not respect and no 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 we have said some things and we must put it into context and perspective and any man that believes that they can just do anything and just expect that the wife is going to bend and conform simply because you're a man or a husband it doesn't happen like that and i reject that on behalf of wives and say to men let us be real men we don't need to go beating our chest and saying, I am the man and the king of the hill and all those kind of things. No, no, no. That was never the intent of Almighty God when he placed man in charge. It was to lead and leading don't mean pushing. You don't push your wife. You lead her. That's what the head does. That's what a leader does. That's what a real man does. You don't push. You lead and your spouses will follow. So those men that are misinformed and you are of the impression that you talk and it happens and this is it and it just goes, that's not how it happens. That's not how we get our spouses to be in conformity. That's not how we get our spouses to follow. No, no, no. And if that has been our attitude, men, it is time to repent. It is time to fix it. It is time to say to the wives that we are treated that way and have placed a wedge in our relationship, I am sorry. And some men need to be saying right now that I am sorry. Some men need to be admitting to their spouses and to God that I am to be blamed for where the thing is right now. There are men that I have spoken to and I've given advice to go a particular way according to scripture. And they leave saying I'm going to do it. And they never do it. And then the thing tumble. And now the whole thing is in a mess. Some men need to repent. Some men need to find an altar. And I, I, I believe that if men cannot be humble enough to come before God and say, God, I was not being the kind of husband. I was not the man that I should be. I'm going to fix it right now. If men can't find the grace to do that and come before God, we are single-handedly, you know, as men, messing up this thing. So although I said a while ago that together we have to work it out because we both have done some things wrong. Together we have to find a solution because we both contributed to the thing being where it is. If somebody is to move to say this thing, uh, I can't, this thing must not continue any further. I cannot be here and you there. It's not right in the sight of God. It's not right in the sight of man. If somebody is to make a move and to take a step to make that happening, no. 
It is you, man. You, husband. And we need to man up now and put aside all pride and everything that I will never do that. Yes, you will have to do it. And there are some men that, well, let me not go there. But yes, it has to be done. And because the man is the leader, and because the man is the head of the household, and the head of the wife, according to scripture, the responsibility is on you, man, to step out of your shell now, to get up, and to find that lady, and to declare that I am sorry. That's where we are. I am sorry to get this thing going because we are the head, because we are in charge. That responsibility is on our shoulders and men need to get up now and stop dragging your relationship through the mud. You are wicked to allow that to be continuing when you know that the responsibility is yours based on what we have said so far. So I'm speaking seriously this evening because there are some folks that believe that it's another Bible study and it soon pass. And the effect of what has been said will soon vanish. It will not. It will not. And as long as you allow your marriage to be going through the mud and you sit there as a, sit there as a man doing nothing, you are proving yourself, O oh man, to be worthless as it relates to your responsibility to God and to your household. Your children suffer because of you. Not you because you cause the problem. Because as I said before, 90% of the time it is shared. But you... Because at this time, you sit there doing nothing when you should be now moving. And I, I say to all men, listen to me. This one is on you. Men, let us move now. You have not been having a good relationship with your wife. You are in one room and she's in another room. Yes, you are in one house and she's at another house. And the, the, chil the children are looking on. The children are seeing it. And you are corrupting another generation. It means that when they grow up, you see what it, most folks don't know, you know, children end up, girls end up with men who are like their fathers if they emulate them. And the worst thing is this. If you are a good father to those children, they are going to pattern you. And just by what you call it now, where the Bible says you sow to the wind and you're going to reap the world. When there is a force at work in life. You would be surprised. The things that we sow, we reap. The things that we, we send out comes back to us multiplying. It is said by those in the, psych, the, the, the field of psychology and they, they, they're trying to put the science together but they see it as a fact based on research but they're trying to find the science to support it. Girl, if there is a husband that beats his wife, his daughters who grow up and repudiate those things when they get married they can't put their hands on it but they find out that they end up marrying to men who end up beat them and men with your sons that beat your wife and drape her up and make the children see oh god that is just wicked and terrible your son is going to grow up and he is going to drape his wife and beat her too. I don't think we know what we're doing. I don't think we know the connection. 
And when God asks us to walk along a certain path, brothers and sisters, it is important that we travel the path. Remember that we said that God has a stake in the, rela in the relationship, in the marriage. What is his stake? We described it some, in one of the sessions that we had. We said that he wanted seed that will become godly seed so that his purpose and his will can continue from generation to generation. So you see that seed that comes from the union? You, man, have a responsibility. For God spoke about Abraham and said, Can I hide anything from my servant Abraham? I have to tell him because this man knows how to command this household and to teach his children to walk and to fear me and to walk in my word. So God will, the state that God has in relationship is that he's depending on you as though he depended on Abraham to make sure that your household and your children follow the godly path that God's will and purpose and plan on this earth can be fulfilled in those offspring. That's God's interest in our relationships, in our marriage. And many of us are causing the children to be deviated from the true path because of how we live. And you can stay there, fool yourselves, men and women of God that are married. You can go off husband with your son away from your wife and say, well, I'm going to keep him and teach him the word. I can't live with her anymore. And I'm going to go away and take custody. And when I have custody, I'm going to bring him up in the right way. Bring him up in what right way? You're damaging him already. Oh, I'm going to take my daughters and the, and the girls will go with me and I will do this and bring her up in the right way. What right way? God's plan for the institution is that the man and the woman be together. That's why he said, whom God joined together, let no man put them asunder. Of course, we're going to read later on that Jesus, and it only takes, because nobody can do it except God. And Jesus made a statement, we'll look at it later on, where he gives the exception to that. So that outside of the same God, no man must bring it asunder. So he expects us to be together so that we can ensure that the offspring goes along a certain way. There are, in fact, there are folks who are still together. And there are folks who have gone as asunder. And you see, when those children grow up and get married and didn't know, don't know, because they don't know these things and they didn't see the example. And there are therefore children that say, You see, you know that there are children going through a thing now, an appearance, one period, because they are ugly. One parent said, Look here, if your daddy tell you this, don't do it. If your daddy tell you that, don't do it. Love him, you know, this, but. And then when the child is with the daddy, look here, if your mommy tell you this, listen to me. If your mommy tell you that, listen to me. You know what we have done with our sons and our daughters? Married people, husband and wives. We have successfully, if we don't deal with things according to Bible, set up a generation to go into marriage and to fail from the start. That's not good. That is bad. With a next generation. In Old Testament times, the Bible said there arose a generation who knew not God. Well, in that generation that came out of Egypt and they saw Moses and um, going up to the mountain and they saw the fire of God and the smoke going up and the loud 
voice and they trembled and said no make god talk moses you go talk to him and they saw what god did there was a generation that when they left egypt they saw the sea opening up there was a generation that when they left egypt and was on their way to canaan they saw manna falling from heaven they knew god and the power of god but after 40 years and wandering in the wilderness and everything the generation died out and then a new generation came according to the bible they did not know god we must be careful of what we transmit husbands and wives we must be careful at what we transmit to the next generation as it relates to marriage and they're going to grow up and say this thing is a farce they are going to grow up and say, this thing is not real. They are going to grow up and say, this thing is not for me. Because of the examples that we set. So instead of doing it the way that we are doing it now, which is not working. And which is hurting the children. And which is bleeding the heart of God. I submit that we try something different. And so, men, now is the time to dust off and get up. Men. Now is the time to de determine that I am going to fix this thing that God put me in charge of. As if I am in charge of it and it is done, it's me God going to come to. And when God comes to your man, what are you going to tell him? That she did wicked? And she did hard? And she just want to have her own way? We have that responsibility, men. Let's act this evening. Find your wife. Make that call. Initiate that action. That's where we are now. Let's be men. Let's be husbands. Let's make the right move. And then there are ladies that have spirits that will not allow them to follow the word of God and be in subjection and submission to a good godly man. A good godly man doesn't mean a man without faults. A, a good man doesn't mean a man without issues in his life. And if you, you present a particular position to your husband and he doesn't accept it, you have no right to hold back, to draw back, to not be supportive simply because he does not accept your suggestion. It is wise for a man to accept and to listen and to discuss and then make a decision. It is wise, it is sin for such a man, for any husband to do that. But let us say that that is done and he decides that I will not go with that one on it. We're going this way. Wife, the responsibility, even if you think he is wrong, if after the discussion he insists to go his way, if after the discussion he continues along that particular path, then I dare say, you are obliged, woman of God, wife that is placed in the relationship, you are obliged to follow and support your husband. The attitude of not doing that, of pulling back, the attitude of not being supportive simply because he did not listen to you is not sufficient grounds for you to pull back and to say I'm not going to be supportive. For you to pull back and then to carry on in another direction and cause the, the cart to be going in two directions. You do not have that right from God to take the thing in another direction. In any institution, in the church or in marriage, there is one head. 
and, and I, we said it before, and even if you don't like the head for whatever reason, there is one. Now, if the head says to the hand, to the foot, or to the feet, let's walk down the road. And then you start to walk, but you're going back way up the road. You know something is wrong with that body. Something is not operating normally. That body is sick. It means the coordination not taking place. If the, if the brain, the head, say to the hand, I want you to write. And the hand just takes up the pen, but is, it can't write. It's just going up and down. Don't, won't we say that that person is sick? If you want to stand up, but every time you try getting up, your feet just not moving to stand up. It means, brothers and sisters, that somewhere between the head, with the brain and the nerve endings that sends the signal to the feet or to the hands, something is off. Transmission is not going through. The nerves might be bad. Something is off. But the brain, the head, and the body is not functioning. It's the same thing in a family with a husband and a wife. And if the decision is made that we're going this direction, and for whatever reason, a wife feels that it should be the other direction, and I'm not going there because me thinks it is that way it must go, and you start to go in the direction that you feel, that body is operating out of order. And it is on account of the wife. So that even if you don't like that particular position, after this question is still going there, yes, you are obliged, O oh woman of God, to follow. It might have challenges, but it's one of the things that we are going to have to live with. And we can live with it in a certain way. We'll go into that later on. But I'm making the point that Although the husband will many instances play his role in messing up and wrecking the marriage, wives similarly play their role in messing up and wrecking the marriage. Therefore, therefore, the call to the husband being the responsible one in that the responsibility of the family and headship was placed on your shoulder, I am calling upon the husband to stand up and let us make the right move. Let us go and say, wife, let us have a talk. But even though the husband is being called upon now to initiate that move, wives, if your husband come, you can't tell him, say, because pastors teach it, make you come. You should have come on your own volition. We are here for each other. And if your husband come, he's really following the word. And I would therefore equally ask tonight for any wife, if your husband come, be open. Because of the word. No, nobody is saying that like, you're going to have to get back together without certain things being put in place. Because there are certainly certain things he can't continue with. And there are certainly certain things you, as a wife, cannot continue with either. So that there will have to be adjustments made. But the fact is, Based on the word of God, God knew all the shortcomings and he knew all the weaknesses and he knew everything about you and he still allowed you to get married and then say at the end, having witnessed everything, whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. We have a responsibility to conform to the word and to work with God to accomplish his purpose. And it is very important. So I wanted us to be very clear on that. I wanted us to know that. Um, that being said, 
and I think we have gone over into my talking. I, I want to do a few questions, right? Because we did say there, there were a lot of them, a couple of them, and you know, I, they are valid, they are important, they are practical, they are real. But remember, what we are talking about is practical, is real, also important. But our guide, our reference point has to be the word of God at all times. And anybody in any corner that tells you otherwise, do not listen to them. Any saint that is encouraging you to leave your husband or to leave your wife, don't take no more of that. Don't listen to them. I give you permission to walk away from that crowd. They don't know God. They don't know the word of God. They're not helping you. And some of the people who you're going to for help, if there are people in the same position that you don't form an association, you won't give yourselves good advice. Use the word of God. Get the advice from the book. Yes? And that's practical. Yeah, that's very practical. And I want us to be practical, but I also, more than anything else, want us to align to the words of Almighty God. So let me let me take a few questions, saints of God, because I, you know, these are legitimate. Folks have written some, a lot have sent them to me, and they just want to know, they want to know what is happening. And, you know, clarity, etc, etc. We'll take a few of the questions. Um, this sister, and incidentally, these are questions that have come from far and wide. These are questions that came in from overseas. So you hear them, don't believe that they are from our local assembly or from an assembly down the road or up the road. Or, no, they are coming from all over. And because a couple of them are similar, so I might read one and you might say this is yours or it sounds like yours. Believe me, there are many similar ones. So we just pull one to represent a certain batch and so that you hear this one, consider it yours if it's similar. Okay? And so this, this person is asking, and this is a lady, this is a wife, and she wants to know if there is any space, even if I don't divorce, can, can, is there any room for separation even for a while? Because there are some times, she says, there are things that are so overwhelming. I, I, am at a, I am at the limit to what I can take. Can there be a limit? And if there is a limit, is there any room for separation? I believe, uh, and so that's the question. I personally believe that there are limits to some things that as human beings we can take right it doesn't mean that we are going to always be at the level where we are at the that critical point but some of us can be pushed to a point where we just cannot take anymore i i know of instances where men saved men were beating their wives and, and, and that is unheard of and that is untenable. I know of instances where men um, so abuse and it, sometimes they don't take um, stick. But I do know of men, and it is frightening, that puts a stick down in a particular place as a threat to their wives. To say that, look here, if you go on certain ways or if you continue along a certain path, and it's you that stick is in here for. And those are things that are just untenable, unacceptable. And given what is happening in our country now, because right now we are seeing men just beating and battered bruising women, but a few years ago, like not very long ago, two, three years ago, it was worse. We saw men just killing the ladies and then killing themselves. And some don't kill themselves. They're trying to escape and it's others kill them. But this is after they kill their spouse. Now, this is crazy, but it happens. Now, if a lady is in a relationship, 
if a sister is in a relationship with a husband that is abusive physically, that beat her with stick, that threaten her with, with, with implements, she is at a breaking point. That is a limit that I can easily say, no, something is wrong there. So the sister is asking, can I take myself out of that situation? And my answer is yes. I would never subscribe to any lady or men because I am seeing a video now that, you know, ladies can be abusive too. But in most instances, it is the men who are the abusive one physically who would take an instrument and hit. I mean, we, we, we saw an image on our screen recently with a man after thumping, hitting, I mean, blow, giving some serious blows to a woman. The, the image, no, the man now takes up a stool, a, a piece of board, and start beating. What craziness is that? Does things like these happen in the church? I am ashamed to say yes. I am ashamed. But it does. A lady like that, asking if I can separate myself from that, I would say to her, yes, because if a man can take a board, a stick, a machete, and beat his wife, he will kill her. And I would not want any lady to stay in a situation where men are that abusive and say, because God is saying, don't separate. The separation isn't divorce, though. We're talking about moving, not necessarily divorce, but moving apart. For preservation, self-preservation. And I'm saying yes. So I don't like to just talk my and, and express myself as an individual. Because I, I love to have word, scripture to back those things up. And so the Bible, I want us to turn it to First Corinthians chapter number seven. Right? I want us to look at scriptures because sometimes there are things that can literally push people to a limit and requires a stepping back so that things can cool down or so that things can be worked out and, and, and we get back to, you know, organizing so that we can keep in line thereafter with the word of God. But it cannot be. And my straight answer to this, sister, is yes, there can be a limit that you just can't go over where you're overburdened. And the same thing would apply to the man. And it might require stepping back, which means to pull apart. It might require stepping back so that there can be breathing space, so that there can be, you know, a time to assess, reassess, you know, get support, get help, and get the thing back to a place where you can reasonably get back together and follow through on what God has in store. So the scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and we, we read verses 10 and 11. 10 and 11. Very important because I, I, I want us to look at scriptures, to look at the word in everything that we do and say so that we are clear that we are in conformity. And so it says, let me put it up on the screen for us. First Corinthians chapter number 7, verses 10 to 14. Let me put it up on the screen for us. I want us to read it together. I want us to, to, to follow. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So Paul is pretty much here um, reiterating the very thing that Jesus spoke about in St. Matthew chapter 19. Yes, he's reiterating it here. So this is the plan. This is the, 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 the basic principle 
the, to those that are married, you know, it is the Lord talking, let not the wife depart from her husband. But then it goes on in verse 11. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So guess what is happening here now? Ideally, they must not depart. Paul is saying, ideally, this is the plan. This is how it ought to be. But if something happens and she has to depart, like if the man beat her with iron and board and do all those kind of things or whatever wicked thing, and she has to depart, she is away remaining unmarried. Or if after a time now and they have been away, they can proceed to be reconciled again. So divorce don't come in here in this instance. Because she's apart, keeping herself, he's apart. And he has no basis to move to do anything either. No act of adultery was committed here or anything like that. And they are remaining unmarried. They are apart. She's going to either stay that way if she removes away from him if she can't deal with it no more because it does happen. Yes? Or if it is that after a while a certain time has passed nerves have been calmed nerves have been settled things have come to the point where we can talk again then let her be reconciled to the husband. In other words, let them come back together. Yes? Let them come back together and continue with what it is. Yes? That God intended for them to have as husband and wife. So we are seeing that while it is that it is the intention of God or, and, and, and he started out by saying it. There is a cause. There is a limit where some things can happen that cause them to be away from each other. Yes, so it does happen. And Paul alludes to it here. And any man that beats his wife and she can't take it anymore and decide to separate herself, let her go. No problem with that man if it is that you are an abuser of your wife. And if the husband moves because of the same thing, because women can abuse their husband too physically and in other ways, not a good thing. It can cause that to happen. And if it is happening to the point where it can't be born anymore, let her depart. Remain unmarried. And in time, once things are cooled down, let them be reconciled. That's Bible. None of us are, are to be squeezing and abusing and butter bruising our spouses, the person that we married to, the person that God allowed to come together with us, the person that God witnessed us together and therefore seal it. We ought not to be butter bruising each other. We ought not to be stabbing each other in the back. And there is a look, be very careful if I might just inject this here. Your husband, your wife, you are together. She's supposed to be your cheerleader. You're supposed to be her cheerleader. If something is wrong, if something has gone wrong, there is no reason to commit treason. 
to go and take your husband and carry him to others and trample him in the face of others and cut and malign and dig his there is no reason to do that if your wife has done something and you are sorely offended there is no reason to now go and take your wife and carry out the act of treason treason is where you betray your company by going to other your country sorry or by going to other countries and pouring out the the secrets of your country to give an advantage to that country to come over and invade you or otherwise. Treason is when you sell out your country. And that is an act in many countries that is punishable by death execution. So you have a problem with your wife, husband. You have a problem with your husband, wife and you committed the act of treason by going to another and tear them down to the ground and what is supposed to be the secret things of your relationship this is not you going for help and you go to a leader or you go to some counselor or advisor and you're pouring out the thing to get help this is you because you want to show how wicked she is and how cruel he is you go to every corner of the earth and declare and describe how cruel and wicked and terrible your wife is how wicked and cruel and terrible your husband is and cause the whole world and the community and the local assembly and the world to find out so you think that he is the most brutal wicked husband there is or she's the most chalous calculating cold despicable wife that there is you have done yourself a great disservice you have committed the act of treason taking your state secret and giving it to another that is wicked yes and i want to use so i am answering that question because it was a question asked it just came forcefully to me we are not to be doing that we cannot commit treason we cannot tear down and dismember and, and and mash down our spouses because we believe even if it is true that they treat us badly he might have treated you badly but look good oh wife you might have treated him badly too she might have treated you badly but look good oh husband you might have treated her badly too so the time that is taken to go and decapacitate our spouses to others and they are just supping it up some people and then they jump on the bandwagon and further hammer you or hammer the husband or hammer the wife to the ground it is bad it is wicked it is un Conscionable. It is unacceptable. And these are things that must not happen. And if they happen, cease and desist. Cease and desist. Ask God for forgiveness. And go to your spouses and say, I have erred. And move on. It must not happen. Point closed. Where that is concerned. Finish. It must not happen. There is no reason. And then to move on thereafter to say based on because that that's hard. But even after that, one question came in. I cannot forgive my wife based on what she has done and her wife also wrote that she can't forgive her husband and what was it that they did something similar the things that the husband heard that the wife said about him and then some things that she equally did he said that he cannot forgive her 
And the very same thing happened with a particular wife. The things that she heard her husband said about him, if the fact that they were wanting love and the fact that they were together and for her to say that about him is as if he said, can't forgive her. Same thing, both sides. Different circumstances, but same thing. I can't forgive. How can you not forgive? Do you expect to make it in the rapture? So we're looking at this marriage thing and we're looking at our Christianity simultaneously. I submit to you, husband, wife, if you cannot forgive your spouse, it does not matter how cruel the act or action was. We have to have a spirit of forgiveness because if we do not forgive men, your heavenly father is not going to forgive you. And if we have sins that are unconfessed and or unforgiven, we have no heaven going. So many of us are on a first class trip right now to hell first class and don't even know it and we feel comfortable clapping our hands and singing and shouting and we can't forgive our husband and we can't forgive our wife but we expect God to forgive us and you know what I have found because the Bible declares it many of us that are Christians and call upon God from the day 10 years ago that we got saved. We commit the same sin almost every day for the 10 years and God forgive us. And then we commit some bigger ones and go to God and God forgive us. And many of us deny him. Many of us betray him. Many of us hide him, would not acknowledge him when we were with friends. And then in the night when we go home, we said, God, forgive me because I just didn't want these people to know that I'm a Christian. We are ashamed of him before our friends. And then we go to him and ask him to forgive us of betraying him, of denying him, of, of being ashamed of him. And then we have the secret sins what we're doing for years and ending. And we go and say, God forgive me. And him forgive us. And then we turn around and say, Oh, my wife, after what she said about me, I will never forgive her. Oh, wicked man. Oh, wicked woman. The Bible declares and that word is there for you. If you don't forgive your brother or your sister. This is not husband and wife thing, no. This is forgiveness for men and women, brothers and sisters. And if you can't forgive your brother, don't sit down there and waste your time and think that God is going to forgive you. He said it in his word. And we better understand that and accept that and be careful how we walk with our Christianity. Look here. Yes, you're a husband. Yes, you're a wife. But you are first a Christian. And that must never be forgotten. That must never be taken lightly. And as Christians, we are called upon to live a certain way. And we have got to be Christians in our marriage. We have got to be a Christian husband. And we have got to be a Christian wife. And if we're looking for the trumpet to sound. And we think we're going to hear it. With a bitter heart and an unforgiving spirit. Let me borrow. 
from a former prime minister of Jamaica and say to you, forget it. Forget it. Bible. Bible. It doesn't happen like that. Very important. Um, question. Please explain why I can't divorce my husband who is worthless, does not support the family, and is just outright uncaring. I have prayed and about this matter hard, and the Lord has spoken to me and has shown me a very humble, caring man, and that man is now showing interest in me. I believe the Lord is directing me to him. No, the Lord is not directing you to him. You need a caring, humble husband. And because you desperately want that, and it is fine to want that, ladies, it is fine and it is reasonable for every wife to want a caring, humble, Christ-like husband. And it is not resident, these traits are not resident in your husband. You are yearning for it. So you go to bed thinking about it and maybe you have a dream about it. But it is not the Lord telling you that you are going to have another husband who is going to be Christ-like and humble and caring and all of that. It is not the Lord. Explain why you cannot divorce so that you can marry to this person. Let us turn to St. Matthew chapter 19. Quick one. St. Matthew chapter 19. Put it up on the screen. I'll show you why. And then, you know, but I've got to just put it straight and plain. It is not the Lord. The Lord don't go against his word. The Lord has a principle. The Lord has established his words. And his words are set and they are yea and amen. Maybe somebody would have suggested that to you. But I started out by saying, do not listen to them. They are not any authority on these things. It is the word of God that is the authority. Yes, people want the best for you. Your mother, your father, your grandmother. You know, everybody wants the best for you. Your relatives from near and far, they want the best. And maybe they too know that your current husband is just worthless. But you are married to him already. And we can move to fix it, move to address it, move to do a couple of things we have spoken about what we have to do. What we cannot do unless he behaves in a certain manner which we are going to look at now then there is no way that you can put him aside and just go and marry to somebody else. It is not scriptural. It is not biblical. It is wrong and wipe it away from our minds. So St. Matthew chapter 19, and I want us to go from about mm, verse, where did I have that scripture? Matthew chapter 19, let us jump from at verse 11. We read 5 and 6 earlier on. Let us jump down to verse 11 as we deal specifically with that. St. Matthew chapter 19, let us jump over to verse 11. Let's put it up on the screen so that we can read together. Let's put it on the screen for our audience so that we can read. St. Matthew chapter number 19. We there? All right, so verse 11. But he said unto them, all men. All right, so let us jump up a little bit. All right. Verse. Let us start at verse 8. Let us start at verse 8. And they were talking to Jesus. And Jesus you now jumped at them, giving an answer. Verse 8, he said unto them. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, 
But from the beginning it was not so. And, verse 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, thus commit adultery. And it is important that we get what the scripture is saying. Look, he, you cannot put away your wife. And what Moses was doing, he was doing it because of the hardness of the heart of the people. And it wasn't right, but God winked at it. He is now saying in verse 9, And I say unto you, so he's telling us what is the state of affairs now. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another committed adultery, and whosoever, yes, whoso marries her, which is put away, does commit adultery. So what he's saying is that no other reason, no other cause save this, the act. And I, I, probably when we meet the next time, I'll tell us why. Because there is something about the act of fornication. The word that is used here refers to either fornication or adultery. No? Right? It's, it's the, the, the actual... Greek word used here covers adultery, fornication, you know, that kind of thing. But and there's a reason why, and we won't get into that, because that is not what we're talking about now. But I'll explain at a later time why this is so heinous and why you have to be careful that we don't engage in sex outside of marriage or, 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 or engage in sexual activity with somebody else who is not our wife. It is dangerous and it, it kills everything. And it joins you to somebody who is not your husband and you become one with somebody else. So all the baggage of those other persons you are going to have carrying with you. But we're not discussing that this evening. But the only reason, the only cause that Jesus gives that will allow for separation as it relates to divorce is for fornication. Not if your husband... Is not a good man, not if your wife is not a good man, not if she don't cook well, not if him don't come home early in the evening. None of those things qualify for us to separate ourselves from our husbands or our wives. But look here, look at verse 10. His disciples say unto him, because what was happening, you know, earlier on, when they started to look and they asked the question, People were divorcing each other for simple reasons. If a wife come into a room where the men were and they were having dinner and the wife came in and she sat around the table and she sneezed and, you know, it, it was an embarrassment to the husband. Boom, reason enough, him can put her away. People, men, put with them wives for those things so that it was no a norm. A, it became the norm that if the husband displeased with his wife, for whatever reason, the food burned, the food never tastes good. He may embarrass because he's bring over his friends and his wife cooked the food and the food never palatable and he was embarrassed. In can divorce her. It was terrible. And Jesus now stood up and spoke emphatically that none of these things, it can be that the food was cold and this was happening in just not nice and in not romantic and a fallout of love with him and a fallout of love with her and all those kind of things. Those are not permissible. Even if he's not Christ-like, you cannot divorce him for that. In fact, the Bible tells us that if your husband is unsaved after you, you married and get saved and you save now your husband and save. Stay with him. Because your life and your submission is what and can be what God used to bring him to this gospel. That's Bible. So all these things where people telling us, I am not being fulfilled in being with this man and so I want to move on. It's not fulfilling being with her anymore and so I want to move on. Brothers and sisters, cut it out. Once and for all, cut it out. And Jesus made it emphatically clear, except for that. To the extent, no, read verse 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, boy, it is not good to marry. 
Because they realize no good. Boy, you mean say, we don't know how that happened, we have to stay with her. We don't know how that happened, we have to stay with him. Boy, it's better me don't marry. That's what, that's what the disciples say, you know. It's a hard thing. But Jesus now said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. In other words, they say, yes, it's hard and it's hard to accept, but you have to understand it's so it goes. But listen to verse 12 now. Listen to verse 12 now, because this is now a serious part that many folks just never read or don't seem to follow what was being said. For Jesus, after them said, this boy is hard, Jesus go further. Hear what he says in verse 12. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, so they can't marry. Because them born, some men just can't, them come with nothing, and that they, they can't operate as a man sexually and even ladies you know don't have the organs and so they are human by uh, eunuchs sorry by birth so jesus is so born from their mother's womb he goes on and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men you remember when the uh, babylonians when the Babylonians went into Jerusalem, they took out their princes. Yes, and Daniel was amongst those that were taken out, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a number of them, and some that you know were in high positions, and they were brilliant, and they had certain uh, knowledge or knowledge in certain areas, mentally, academically. They were strong and powerful. They took these men and carried them over to Babylon. And they made them eunuchs. Couldn't have children. In fact, Daniel and the others were given to the head of the eunuchs. So there was a eunuch that was in charge of making the other men eunuchs. And they were there for one purpose only. God, um, the king didn't want them to be procreating and he just wanted them for one purpose. So they became eunuchs. Men made them eunuchs, castrate them. And Jesus now said, and there were some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. But here in the third part of Jesus' statement, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Remember now, you know, all these scriptures line up and tie up, you know. Yes, line up and tie up. And he's here talking about, except for fornication, you can't divorce and then marry again. But some people, for whatever reason, and even though a divorce is not right, but some people separate themselves and decide not to go back together. Shouldn't happen. But if anything and them have to go back, let them be reconciled. But they must remain unmarried. He now links up all of that and say, listen to me. If he or she don't commit the act, you have no grounds of separating yourself and remarrying. Otherwise, it is adultery. So you guess what we're fighting now? If they don't commit the act and you separate yourself for the kingdom's sake, you will have to remain a eunuch. Read the scripture. Good. And he said, that is to tell us how serious this thing is. So some people have been drawn back and say, I can't deal with it no more. I don't want nobody to kill you. The Bible, nobody must, your husband must kill you and beat you to death. Or no wife must, in your sleep, take up a knife and stab you because they can't deal with it no more. I know Christians. Christian wife would take knife and cut up their husband to kill them and the husband had to run away for dear life. It happens. And if that couple did not commit the act of adultery, even with the knife and her attempt at his life, it is not grounds for them to separate, to get divorced and then married again. It sounds hard. That is exactly what the disciples said. In this case, boy, it's not good for get married. That's what the disciples were saying. I better never get married then because if things get rough and me, me. that's what the disciples were saying. Jesus know that re referred back now to what they were saying. I said, listen, no? listen. The whole thing is in one 
discourse about marriage and divorce. And Jesus said to them, look here. Some people born eunuch. Some people men near them eunuch. Some people have to become a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. If you decide that you're going to make it in, you better know that if it can't work and you have to separate yourself, you're going to have to keep to yourself and remain a eunuch for the kingdom. sake. So my answer to the lady that wrote, can I devote, tell me why I can't divorce my husband for the reason I just gave? No, you cannot. You're going to, it can work, and we can try to get it worked out. And even if you feel like you want to separate yourself for a while, and then try to get back, fine. But in any case, if you decide to separate for a while and you stay separated, you're going to have to be separated. And the Christ-like guy that is humble, that you see, is not Jesus sending to you. You just see him and like him. And you cannot have him. Tell yourself that you cannot have him. And that's just how the Bible puts it, right? And being straight and being honest, it sounds hard, but it is the word. And we have to understand. And let me tell you, 90% of folks who move from one marriage to another and another, the statistics have shown, the research have shown, that the first one that you thought was bad always proves to be better than the next one that you thought would have been better. Because the same issues that you experience with your husband now, any husband or wife that you marry, you will experience. If it's not that, it's going to be something else. I'm telling us, our best bet is to try to make what we have work. And I know it can. I know. I, I, I tell you about we have the best people. So our folks here, folks that I've spoken to, that are overseas, that are some of the nicest and best people. And I know that the thing can work. Some are so spiritual. I know that it can work. A marriage can make you or break, you know. And it don't have to break your saints of God. I'm telling you. And don't be afraid to reach out. Reach out to the right folks. Reach out to the leaders in, in, in your church. And you, you, you can't know who you can go to. And try, But it can work. And don't talk about the next one and the next one and the next one. As the more you go down the line. It, do, it doesn't mean that a situation cannot happen. And because the act was committed and you move on and you get married. Yes, it can be good. And it can be better. It can. But I'm saying to us. The research, the statistics have shown, and it is, it, there's a reason why the statistics show that they get progressive the worse. The reason simply is that any man or woman that you go to, it is just a thought that it is going to be, this is now my real Romeo. One lady, um, Elizabeth Taylor, married about eight times searching for the right one. So many of these folks married four times. Presidents married three times. Uh, counselors that counsel people to get married and to stay married, married four times. I don't know how we can counsel anybody. And people go to him. And then the word that tells us to walk a certain way and do it a certain way and suffer certain things because it will come or we don't want the word. But we'd rather go to somebody who couldn't keep theirs. But you want the advice because he's somebody of stature. Follow the word, brothers and sisters. Follow the word. I think the time is up on us, so I will stop. What if the husband as head require me to do something that is clearly against the will of God? are clearly against God's will. You have taught that the wife must be submissive. 
and in subjection to their husband. What if the husband, as the head, require me to do something that is clearly against God's will? Don't follow him. It is the only time that grounds is given for you because it is better to obey God rather than man. Once something is there, once your husband who is the head of the house and your head is now giving directions and instructions contrary to God who made him the head, then he is going contrary to the word and to God. And you therefore have a, as a wife has the, have the obligation to not follow him and to follow God first because you're, uh, you are first of all more in line and in tune to God and the things of God than to your husband. God put him there now as a head for him to lead as God's word directs him. And once he's out of line or going contrary to the will of God or telling you to do something that is against God's will, then you have an obligation to follow God first and not him. Is that biblical? Let us quickly, and this is the last one. I'll do no more questions after this. Acts chapter 5. And let's put it up on the screen quickly. Acts chapter 5, 27 to 29. Uh, there are so many, but I had to start the way I started. I really wanted to do a little review in, in a different way, but still capturing the things that I said over the weeks, and it is important. I really wanted to get to the point where I confront our men, all of us as men, and so that we can move to do what we must do. And then I wanted to speak to the ladies, because if your husband comes and say that he's sorry it is not good to brush aside and to put aside no because if we did something wrong and we went to our husband spiritually now within the church who is jesus and his blood i know you told me not to do it and i did it again i did it last year i did it the year before i did it here and i come back again and i do it i know you're expecting that he is going to forgive you you want him to forgive you and we must be careful where we expect God to forgive us. We must be careful where we expect God to forgive us and we don't want to forgive our brethren. It is, It will go against us. We will not be guiltless and we are going to have issues. So we just had to go that way. We took a few. So next week we talk some other things and probably another two weeks from now. So we're going to look to wrap up this in about three weeks. We take some more questions and we we'll try to be as practical as possible. So Acts chapter 5, um, verses 27 to 29, thereabouts. Uh, let's put it on the screen. Amen. And so that we can read together. Let's put it on the screen. I know I'm still at right. Praise God. All right. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now notice that this is the same Peter and Apostles who in other scriptures tell us that we must obey those that rule over us. And we must subject ourselves to magistrates and to rulers and to those that rule in government. Yet... Look at what they just did. Jesus' word is clear, and this is why I keep insisting that it is important that we understand and that we take the word of God seriously. They knew that Jesus' word 
had to be obeyed even among men but they also knew that Jesus said give to Caesar what is due to Caesar they knew that Jesus told them that they must obey those that have the rule over them which is talking about the authority of the land yet when they were confronted when the authority told them to do something contrary to the word and when you and I are being told to do things contrary to the word, we must know the word so that we can reject it. And so here, they knew the word. They knew that Jesus told them to go preach and go preach in my name. Now the leaders of the land said, do not preach in this name. They had a dilemma. Jesus said, go preach in my name. The rulers of the land, the same rulers that Jesus told them to obey those that have the rule of you over you. No told them not to preach in the name. They had a dilemma. What did they do? They chose to obey God rather than man. But you can only obey God if you know the word of God, if you know what God is saying, if you know where he's leading and where he's directing. And this word is clear with a lot of the things that confronts us, whether in relationships or in other matters. The point is we must know the word and we must act on the word. And here the word tells us that go and preach in my name. A force is telling them, don't do it. Not doing it is against the will of God. Walk in the will of God. It means that what God says takes preeminence. And what they did here is the profile that we must follow. If your husband, therefore, um, wife, is insisting that you do some things that are ungodly out of the will of God if he is into illicit things and he says because you're my wife you have to join me in this illicit activity and affair my answer to you is no you do not have to conform to that and you should not because it is wrong it is sin it is against the word of God and I would suggest to you just as this scripture declares in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 we ought to obey God rather than men I stop at that the Lord bless you thank you for joining um, in Bible study one more time uh, we just I hope we understand that we have to talk like this sometimes. This is important because the, the, the issues are so real. And because we might be misinformed or misguided, sometimes we go along a path that is just not the right path. And I want to instill in our minds that there is a way, you know, it might seem right to you because it is the conventional approach of the world, but don't use the world system and what everybody else does as the benchmark. And as the reference point, use the word of God and you, you, you won't go wrong. Sometimes you have to be a bit strident and a bit, you know, forceful, but it is just what it is. And, uh, you know, Brother Daly, love all of you, all of us, but we have to just present it as it is. And I want us to love the word and to embrace the Lord Jesus. Every one of us can and ought to make it when the trumpet sounds and whatever it is that is happening in your relationship take it from me if jesus forgive you of any and everything he, you can deal with any and every matter in your relationship take it from me and the church and our marriage relationship you look at the reflection you look at it look at what was said before go over the things look at it see the reflection and you realize that, look, if Jesus can forgive you, husband, you can forgive your wife. Wife, you can forgive your husband. It is the biblical principle. Every biblical principle manifests itself in the relationship between a husband and a wife. Every one of them. And we pick up another, another time. God bless you. Just before I pray, I want to invite every saint here in Jamaica, our local assembly, right across the fam family in Jamaica, across 
the world wherever you are all our visitors and friends next well not next week this sunday and next sunday we are going right into ignite ignite 2021 which is our youth convention and although we can gather in one place everybody we are going to be lighting the place afire and so every house is going to catch a fire every gathering place is going to catch a fire because the place will be ignited and our young people they are going to be on parade they are going to be on fire as they take this gospel to the whole world via the means of our virtual platform so on sunday i know we will be having visiting ministers uh locally i believe overseas too if overseas will be there of course you know it's going to be virtual local ministers uh, might be coming into the assembly even sunday morning it's going to be 30 persons in total and that includes the media and the singers and so forth but we're going to try to see how it can be worked out but it will be beamed on youtube i want us all to be in service sunday morning the youth will be in charge and brother gail our youth president and his team will be pumping in the holy ghost and it promises to be a grand 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 time and i invite all of us yes to pull all the stops and to be there nine o'clock this sunday nine o'clock the other sunday and then in the evening i believe it is six o'clock there will be evening sessions and uh seven o'clock seven o'clock i'm sorry there will be evening sessions and we are going to be having a grand time so the evening sessions will be uh on zoom and of course it is also going to be streamed via youtube and facebook so it promises to be great we are going to have a grand time in the holy ghost as the spirit of god ignite our hearts and we ask you to get your friends at work yeah get your friends from school send the links to everybody all those new folks in your contacts send it out and do the work of an evangelist and have everybody to be ready for ignite 2021 it promises to be a time of refreshing rejoicing renewal and let's just throw ourselves in it in the name of the lord jesus god bless you in his great name let us pray father we bless you we thank you for another night of bible study we thank you for joining us together we thank you for teaching us all of us help us to do the things that we must do to make adjustments where we must make adjustments mighty god i pray that you will give strength i pray that you will give courage i pray that you will give boldness this evening tonight to the men who are wondering how can they make the move given how much time has elapsed and how far the thing has gone in terms of distance from where it used to be in their relationship i pray that you will grant them that boldness tonight so that in short order they will make the move that must be made to have their families reconciled because we as men are the ones that have the responsibility to get our houses in order i pray for every hurting wife i pray that you will help them to recognize that they too have a role to accept and appreciate the the advance of their husband even at this time and help that the heart will be there so that together they can speak again uh, a fire will be kindled again and together we can walk and talk and rejoice in the presence of god in the house of god in the home where they live and they can there can be togetherness one more time let it happen we pray mighty god let your perfect will be done we give you thanks and we praise you in jesus name in jesus name amen and amen god bless you god's willing next week same time we come together for another bible study in jesus name amen